Sister, question on those angry women at the top there screaming that you were talking to. Have you no fear that you could get killed in these situations? No, I never have feared that way. Um, it's not because I'm a fearless person or I'm brave, because I'm not brave. Brave are what the gladiators were and courageous are what the Christians were. I believe I have a Christian courage that I know that to back out when you should step in is cowardly. And it's failing to do the mission that you gave your promise to God to complete. And so my fear, the, the saying, the only thing you have to fear is fear, is very true of me. I would be afraid to be afraid at the moment I am most needed. And so, no, I'm not, I have been not, but never been afraid for myself, for my own safety. And I believe it truly is a grace that God has given me. Because first of all, I bring love, and it's not my own love. I bring hope, I bring faith, I bring kindness and mercy to people that are like giving somebody dying a drop of water, just dying of thirst. And so I'm loved, very, very loved. And so I would have nothing to be afraid of, or no one to be afraid of. On a couple of occasions where maybe I was near a fearful situation, or I could have uh, said, I'm afraid, God just gave me the courage because I didn't have to look for it. If I had to search for it, it'd be different. It was natural, just a very natural response to the need. And so I've never had occasion really to be afraid. Uh, so I, 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 maybe once or twice, once a man started to strangle me from behind me, but he was a mentally ill patient that had just come into the prison. And I didn't know who it was. I thought somebody was joking for a minute. And then I realized he was choking me. But the people in front of me saw him and they were so shocked they didn't move for a minute. And then they did. And they, uh, I said, please don't hurt him. He's just a boy and he's mentally ill. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, don't hurt him. And they didn't. I said, take him to the, the uh, mentally ill, you know, tank for the mentally ill, uh, F tank they call it. Take him there, he's, he's not well. And the, uh, one of the guards went to the commandante and he said, I, I don't think it's right for Mother Antonia to be walking around this yard without any protection at all. I think she should have a guard with her. And I thought that, but before I could say anything, the commandante said, you think that uh, she's not safe inside? I would feel safer walking with her on the inside than with 50 guards around me. <laughs> so that's what love is, that love never fails. Sister, when the riots were over, you must have interfaced with these women who were up there screaming and, and, and agitating. Yes, I was. Um, how do you reach out to them? I mean, do you, do you kind of like, if, if I were them, I might say to myself, oh, she told us not to do this, we did it. Well, More people died. Um, I told them, I did tell them. So what I do you said, do after I, the They fact know now? I love them, I love you, but the blood of those men are on your hands. You have to examine your conscience and go to confession because you have brought about this riot. The men had quieted down. They were ready to start rehabilitation and rebuilding the prison. The Mexican government was putting a fortune into rebuilding and bringing in food and trying to console and taking care of the wounded in the infirmary, doing everything we could to make things better. And now you started something that made things much worse and we have to go back and start all over. But God loves you and I love you, but God loves you more. And I, 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 who am I to forgive? God is the one who forgives. Go to God, but know what you've done. You have to know what you've done in life. You have to know when you've hurt somebody, when you've gossiped about them, when you haven't forgiven them, when you've been mean or unkind to someone. You have to look at those things and know. Because John, for every crime like that that you can see, somebody starting a riot or somebody uh, killing somebody, for every violent crime you read about, there's a thousand good things that God wants us to do and we don't do it. And those are, those are sins or crimes against God of indifference and, and uh, I don't know and I don't care because people all over can do something, one little thing, one thing to make life better for one person 
And so often we're self-centered. We are thinking about our own lives, our own safety, our own well-being, our own happiness. And so we don't reach out. And if everybody listening could just every day think of one thing they could do for somebody. Now maybe that would be, I don't have money, I don't have transportation, I don't have anything to give. Yes, you do. You have yourself. You can say a prayer for somebody. Maybe you'll pray for somebody you don't even know. And as I said, there might be a boy that has a gun and it's laying around the table. He's ready to put his hand in the gun to, against somebody else or to his own head. And maybe your prayer that travels faster than a cell phone, faster than lightning, faster than, than uh, Superman. You, you say a prayer for that person, the unknown, there's an unknown person that needs my prayer and I'm praying for him, boom, it reaches him because God is God. And if you can see things on a monitor or a television or a, a cellular, what can you do with the power that God has given us? He's told us we can move mountains. You can stop all wars and abortion and death penalties and, and brutality and crime. If you can't do anything, you can pray. Even if you don't like to pray, you can just say, Lord, I'm not a good prayer, you know. Maybe I have to fast a half a day. Maybe I have to do something to say, I care. I care about you. I care about, I want to love you more every day. Oh, sacred heart of Jesus, I implore that I may learn to love you more and more. Sister, I have a picture here of a young man getting dental care and then uh, chose a picture of his teeth with a nice smile on his face. You mentioned to me during, um, before the program that the average prisoner does about three years there. This man's been released and he's employed doing well. Does a dentist come in because of pro bono? You, you asked him to come in and I, he volunteers? I, he's a friend. He's and a friend. I ask him to come in. Yes, I do. And he comes uh, on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And he attends about 10 people each time. And we have a list of about 500 people waiting because everybody wants to be able to smile. It's so terrible not to. In the house that we have, we have a home, Campos de San Miguel, the fields of St. Michael. And in that house, we have women with cancer mainly, although the house was really given to us to, uh, for women leaving prison and women visiting prison. But so often they can't find it because they get out late at night. And most women want to go home to their children right as fast as they can get there. And so only a few women come. And the women, most of the prisoners are not aware that their mothers can, and sisters and children, daughters can come to that home. But we had 300 women stop there last year. Uh, with 150 with cancer, we would say, and 150 accompanying them because we allow, uh, we, we encourage the person who comes to bring a member of their family or a good friend so they don't feel alone. And, one, uh, and we fix their teeth too. If I see anybody that needs their teeth filled, I know, fix, I know God's gonna take care of the money. I just say, you have to go to the dentist because in Mexico, it's not the way it is here. Maybe it will we'll pay $250 and the, at the very most 500 to give a person a beautiful, beautiful smile. And w what you're giving them is you're changing their life. They said, I have a new face, mother. I have a new life. And the one woman with cancer, that she touches my heart because somebody says she's in the, the last stage of cancer. She's not going to live very long. And I said, well, then she's going to live with a smile. We're going to give her a smile from now till the day she dies. And she said, I never thought I'd live long enough that I'd ever be able to smile, that I'd ever have teeth. It's Sister. a very important mission and one that we, we don't limit our, our love. And so we don't limit our service. In the house that we have, John, we have uh, last month, 4,000 people came to the door for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of water or or maybe a juice, something. And when it gets cold, we'll make a tole or oatmeal or something and serve that in a cup. And then we have about 150 families that come for like baskets of food a month, the poor families. So you, you're in the prison doing that ministry, but you've got your sisters and your work outside. Absolutely. When do you rest? When do I? Yeah, when do you rest? I rest in my, my bunk in the prison. And let me tell you, I, I looked up one day, I was dreaming right before I woke up, and I had a, a, I have a large crucifix above my bed. 
and I felt that Je Jesus fell right into my arms. I felt his flesh. And then I opened my eyes, and I realized that he wasn't in my arms. I looked right up at the crucifix, expecting to see that the body, the cuerpo, wouldn't be on the cross. And of course, it was on the cross. And then I felt like my conscience said, the Lord speaking to me, you lazy woman, get out of that bed. <laughs> You're, it's, I'm not going to take you. You're not going this soon. You get out there. You want to take me in your arms? Take those men that are, and women that are chained or handcuffed. Take them in your arms that are coming into the prison or going to court. Put your arms around the lonely and the, and the whoever it is that needs you. Give your love to them and you give your love to me. Sister, I want to uh, show this picture too before we close here. This is a picture of so many of your sisters and obviously you can see by their ages um, none of them have been with you more than 12 years that there's an awful lot of mothers like yourself mm -hmm. who have you know at 50 60 years old whatever decided to join you yes um, are, are you a bunch of, of, of mothers who just want to keep mothering Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're right, John. We never, we never stop mothering. I, when I left, they I came to the prison. Uh, you don't make deals with God, but I said, Lord, I'm going to look at every one of your children that I'm going to encounter, no matter what who they are, whatever they've done, if they're how ugly or or dirty or young or old or whatever. And I'm going to take each one as if it were my own son or my own daughter. And then, but, but Lord, I'm going to give you my children. And that, then they'll become your children completely. You take care of mine, and I'll take care of yours. And so that's kind of the way it is. The Lord has taken very good care of my children for the last 32 years. And my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. So I always feel that uh, I wasn't making a deal, but I ask. Please, Lord, take care of mine, and I'll promise I'll take care of yours. I've never found anybody hard to love, truthfully. I've never, I've never had to. I'm blessed because it's not a hard mission. It would be a hard mission if I was somebody judging. I'm not judgmental, only about unkindness and unmerciful behavior and coping with things we shouldn't be able to cope with. That I'm, I'm judgmental about, and I shouldn't be judgmental about that. However, not about the people, but the idea of it. But I'm not judgmental about people, and so I always know there's a reason that I can't see. I can see something that happened, but I don't see the motive for, it, for that happening. And so, as a Mexican people have that saying, who am I to judge? I feel that way about myself. If I, I don't ask what crime are you here for, what have you done? I do tell them the Lord will never turn away from the good book, a heart that's repentant, and God is love. And so count on that love. Oh. Sister, thank you so much. Thank you. For blessing us with your presence and Brothers and sisters, what an incredible witness. So if you're wondering, any of you women out there or guys or anything, and you're 60, 70, 80 years old, think of all the things you can do. Look what this ball of fires did. Look forward to seeing you on another program.